Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Mark's Backyard Birds. It is the first few days of March, and today's topic is the one that we have started answering fairly early this year, but it is always a, a topic of conversation. As soon as the cold winter spent snap that is usually January so so cold and then February's cold. Well, this year, February was extremely warm here in Kansas City. But once people get a, the first glimpse, the first taste of that warm air um, in the early spring, then the questions come in. When will my hummingbirds be back? Should I put my hummingbird feeder out now? When should I put my hummingbird feeder out? How about the Orioles? How about the rose-breasted grosbeaks? All those guys. So I, I address this topic a lot in the spring here at the store. And I thought, well, let's do this, a, a video on it. Um, I know I've done it in glimpses and other programs in the past. and But this one we're going to dedicate to uh, basically uh, spring migration with hummingbirds and our other favorite backyard birds and when we can expect it. So the first thing is don't get too excited. <laughs> it is still really, really early. Um, and the biological facts behind that, the biological reasoning behind that is, I always I always say, birds in Costa Rica don't know what the weather's like in Kansas City. They don't have weather.com or anything uh, down there, and they, and they have to rely on their internal instincts. And remember, birds have been making these migrations for forever, uh, and they, they migrate for a reason. And timing of spring migration, remember in fall migration, uh, the birds kind of came real staggering through uh, your area. You know, it, it was really spread out because the birds are making their way to the wintering grounds and they go there. And, and most of those neotropic migrants, as we call them, go there because they have to know uh, that they're going to have a reliable source of their favorite foods. And then up in our area and then especially to the north and most of the lower 48, uh, you know, flowers and insects can't be depended on during the harshest parts of winter. So they head south and they do this. And then and it, hey, hummingbirds, uh, uh, some hummingbirds, yes, do uh, spend the winters down uh, along the Gulf Coast and uh, in Texas and South Texas, things like that. But most of them go down into Mexico, Southern Mexico, Northern Central America. They they are down in that region uh, and they're eating on the flowers that have been uh, bountiful for them in the rainforest and, and the, uh, the insects that are there all year round. And the question always comes up, well, why in the world don't they just stay there and have their babies down there? Why do they bother migrating and risking that dangerous journey back north? And the, the simple answer is, as rich as the rainforest ecosystem is with all the birds that do nest there, it is not it would not be able to sustain enough uh, food for all of our birds to nest there as well. Because remember, almost almost all of our birds uh, and that nest here in North America have to feed their babies insects. So yes, I know there are ex uh, exclusions to that, like the dove and pigeon group and goldfinches don't eat it, feed their babies insects, but almost all other birds do. So when, when they time their spring migration, and they're much more typically in a hurry in the spring because they want to get to their nesting grounds, whether they nested in your backyard or where they nested in northern Minnesota or they were in southern Canada or in northern Canada and, and, and all through, they are timing their migration because they want to get back onto their nesting grounds and have their lay their eggs, have their babies for when their the the most amount of food or their favorite food is available. Some some birds are really pretty precise in what they want to feed. They're pretty selective in the in, uh, the insects and, and their hatches and and certain types of trees. Now hummingbirds obviously are are more in, uh, dependent on the flower and the nectar, but believe me, they do feed their babies insects and, and, and setting up you know little uh, fruit feeders that produce fruit flies and they snap those and and they 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 will gather up tiny little insects to feed their babies. So their migration is okay. When their bodies start to tell them that, boy, you know, uh, uh, the day length is changing, the days are changing, and getting longer. So I know that the timing uh, is right for the, the nesting grounds are going to be ready when I go. And so they start migrating north. 
And this is where her weather and wind patterns can influence if they're a little earlier than normal or if they're a little later than normal. Once they get uh, you know, up to southern Texas, central Texas, and there's already some sightings down in that region in, uh, of the country across the south. Uh, it's always hard to tell whether those are birds that actually spent the winter there or if they are truly just returning. But there, there are some sightings already down there. But once they get into the southern part of the range, then the winds shifting out of the south and can help push them up north. But their average return date, and I got this map yeah, from uh, hummingbirdcentral.com, uh, as uh, you can see down here below. Uh, and this is a really good map showing the bars of where the average return date is each year. And we always tell our customers in Kansas City, tax day. About April 15th is a safe date. Now, is that creeping up a little earlier? Because we know uh, that climate change is affecting birds and their nesting. Um, uh, and, and wind patterns are so important that that average return date may actually get pushed a little earlier uh, and once we uh, analyze data from the recent several years and, and watch the patterns. But tax day is still a really good day. Now, I like to have my hummingbird feeders up about the first week of April. And I only put a little bit of nectar in there because I know I'm going to waste most of it because their hummingbirds are usually not here. And the picture, wherever you are in this range, um, you can see you can see that it's gradual. They they return, and you know I've, I've said this several times that I read many years ago that spring moves north about 12 miles a day, and and so that includes you know the soil temperatures warming, plants growth flowers blooming, things like that spring moving forward. And the and birds, especially birds that are dependent on nectar, like hummingbirds, are moving with spring. And a lot of that is what this map indicates. And they have to fly, you know, 100 miles a night or whatever they can get in. Then they have to feed and, and gain more weight before they can make that. Remember, these birds can't fly against the wind when it's blowing out of the north. So once day length gets there and drives them, then they, it, the amount of time it takes them to get all the way to where they're, they're, they're want to be nesting, then that can really be weather dependent. So cold fronts come through, wind blows out of the north, they're stuck right where they are for a few days. Then the wind shifts out of the south, warm air comes up, pushes them, uh, helps push them up further and further. So um, spring migration is a fascinating thing. And one of the reasons I love, this is Mary's picture, one of Mary's pictures, and the, the bluebells are one of the first flowers that you can, you know, landscape with and plant uh, wildflowers that actually bloom in the spring. And so they can be a really important food source. And so when we talk about landscaping for members, we always talk about having things that bloom in your yard all through the season because they're going to need that nectar. But really early plants and even those that are really late for the fall migration as well. But so we should call this hummingbirds and friends because it applies to other other birds as well. Another picture I really love is this uh, Baltimore Oriole picture that uh, my customer Teresa Havens took many years ago. And I love it because this Baltimore Oriole is feeding on uh, the nectar and petals of a black locust tree. And that is the tree I key on every year uh, in this area, at least in the time when the, the, the Baltimore Orioles returns. Now, <clears throat> we have a really cold, cold spring. These, thing, these, these black locust trees are later blooming. If we have a really early, early spring, they can start opening up much earlier. Well, if when the Baltimore Orioles are coming through, if they come through right when these are in full bloom, our, our feeders are much slower because they're getting their natural food that they really like and it's bountiful. But if they come through and it's late and these aren't blooming yet, then our Oriole feeders tend to be a lot busier because there's not as much natural food out for them. So timing on that can be critical. But we say there and here in Kansas City is about the 15th of April. Most of them come in a little bit later than that. But if you want to be ahead of the game, getting them up but like the middle of April is usually a pretty safe bet. Now, you guys, of course, to the north and to the south need to adjust that. I know uh, down in Alabama, we've already had reports of Orioles coming to feeders down there. So things are happening. Migration is, that, especially down along the Gulf Coast states, those birds are, are starting to really push forward. But, I, you know, I, if you watched my video, I was just down in Cozumel a couple of weeks ago, and I saw many of our nesting birds down there 
feeding in the low brush, whereas like this American Red Star, I saw several of them down there, and they were in the really low brush feeding, whereas when we see them here, they're high up in the, in the tops of trees and, and feeding up there. And uh, it's really fun to see the difference in their feeding habits in the south and their wintering grounds, but they're going to be on their way soon. We saw you know, another bird that's usually really high up in the trees is this northern parala. Uh, and, and they're one of our earliest warbler migrants that come in. And so they like to take advantage of the early, early budding of trees and the and the insects that attach, says in the, in the early hatches of worms. Some of you guys' favorites, like indigo buntings, I saw several of those down there in Cozumel, males and females. We saw several painted buntings down there uh, in their wintering ground, doing what they should. And yes, we did see rose-breasted gross beaks as well, um, bird watching down there. So they'll be back. Uh, but they're, it's amazing how it averages out. We think, wow, it's really, really warm this year. They're going to be coming in early. And still, they tend to show up on average uh, at their usual date and time. So, uh, you know, Rosebreast and Grease Week, I really started looking for them the last week of April, maybe the first week of May. Uh, but the it, 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 spring migration will be on time. And that's, I, I know we always uh, say, I, I, I want them coming. I want to come. I want to get my fears out. I want to be ready for them. And I understand that. Uh, if you do, or you're once with now, if you put jelly out for your Orioles, the, the house finches are going to be eating on it and other birds too. So there's no harm in putting out your Oriole feeders early, but just know they're probably going to be back about that same window of time uh, as they did last year. So uh, it, it, I call this the winter of three weeks. That's about all the weather we've had here in Kansas City. Been, we had one of the warmest Februarys on record. It was really warm in December. We had that three-week stretch in, in January. It's the only winter that I feel like we've really had this year. So every year is different, but to birds, they don't know that. They're coming back, and they're going to be here about the same time they do every year. So really good idea for a program. Thanks for, you know, keep asking those questions because we love to answer them. Send in ideas for future programs. Give the videos a like and a share, if you will. Um, until then, come on, let's talk birds.